Yeah, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, perhaps uh, we could just first introduce ourselves and start talking about our relationship with seaweed. I'm, I'm Jo. <laughs> and I'm Angie. Um, I work in conservation. I'm a marine biologist. And uh, I think I, well, I've always been keen on seaweeds, but I first got really into them through scuba diving. Um, I ran a project in the Isles of Scilly years ago, which involved diving and a shore survey um, for seaweeds. And I was really inspired by the experts who came along, but also through being just literally immersed <laughs> in the seaweeds in that shallow sunlit water and seeing that gorgeous array of colours and the forms that they take. Um, and I just love the way they move and look so completely different when you see them out of water. Um, I did an advanced um, identification course on seaweeds uh, a bit before um, the first lockdown. And so um, I, I always think it's really important to keep practicing that ID and keeping those ID muscles strong. <laughs> That's my relationship with seaweeds. <laughs> Um, and then I think seaweeds first caught my eye probably on the west coast of Scotland actually. Um, so I was living in Edinburgh at the time, and um, I could I just remember on that west coast seeing the seaweeds kind of banked up in layers across the across the long um, beach, and just sort of being amazed by by the colours, you know, the browns and the, and, and got, you know, sort of goldeny colours, and darker up further up and reds. Um, so yeah, I think that yeah impacted my brain quite a lot with seaweeds. And then um, down here um, in Port Guara, I remember seeing a floating red just as I was kind of down in the shallows, and uh, that just kind of really zinged onto my brain, and the, <laughs> and I was hooked with that kind of pinky, the translucence of that, I think. Um, and then in the decade of, I guess. Sort of committing to artwork full time. Um, seaweeds inspired my work so much um, in lots of different ways um, and so much of my uh, creativity and it definitely keeps me heading back down to the to the cove from the studio where where the land meets the sea. Yeah so do you remember how we found ourselves exploring seaweeds together? <laughs> well I think we we met through the St Agnes Marine Conservation Group, didn't mm -hmm. we? Um, we've been involved in different ways over the years. Yeah. Then there was that day, it was, there was a day in February, um, uh, it was 2020, so it was just before the first lockdown, not that we knew it was coming, and it was a really <laughs> lovely spring tide, yeah. um, and it was a beautiful day, um, and I, I was just going to pop down and have a look at the seaweeds, and I called by your studio on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and said, uh, she wants to come out. <laughs> Do you fancy coming with me? <laughs> yeah. Um, we're so lucky uh, just to have Tremont's Cove on our doorsteps. <laughs> really. I know, just a short walk downhill. And we happen to have some of the best rock pools on this stretch of coast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like you say, this kind of amazing variety of species and the beauty of it just blows my mind every time. Um, there's always seems to be something new to find there, but lots of old favourites to visit as well in terms of the seaweeds. So, yeah. I know, I know. I love that about rock pooling. It's always changing. And then um, I think on those first trips before lockdown, we would just get carried away. And we, <laughs> we, um, we never seem to be wearing the right clothes as we went down onto the lower and lower shore. Yeah, it's true. So it's really easy, isn't it? It's you, you get really excited and go down into those gullies with the kelp kind of swaying and the low tide pools. And we we sort of waded in with our skirts kind of tucked into our leggings. <laughs> um, and it, but it sort of was reminiscent for me of the stories that I'd heard of, of ladies uh, in previous centuries previous generations who who were seaweed explorers and, and researchers um, yeah. so maybe it was just a continuation of that yeah <laughs> and we overtopped our wellies yeah <laughs> um, but it was just lovely to kind of take time observing and it was beautiful um, warm weather for february yeah. and the rock pools were just kind of coming to life this early spring and the seaweeds um, were looking really fresh and shiny and lovely. 
Um, so I think it was more like her well-being yeah. kind of activity yeah, at that true. point rather than being some deliberate kind of collaboration. Yeah, yeah. very definitely. I certainly had no idea what it would lead no. to. <laughs> Little did we know. Um, yeah, and I think you're right. And there was a lot at that time about kind of the well-being and getting out for your daily exercise. Um, and um, yeah, some people go for a run, but we were kind of our happiest kind of yeah, take, you know, taking our time down on the on the shoreline. Yeah. So when um, lockdown started, I was naturally drawn to the shore, and I knew. That we were incredibly lucky that we were able to just walk there from yeah. the house because do you remember we weren't allowed to drive at no. that time um so we're very lucky um and the children were children were home from school mm. and we just ended up planning our days around the tides yeah. and then so that we could get down there on the shore at the right time and there wasn't any formal um learning coming from school at that point so it was just an amazing opportunity to get get out there with the children and get to know um and that area really well in fact we ended up giving all the rock pools and the different rocks names um making it up and then um, i think just like for so many people it was a chance to really get to know your own home turf yeah. very well only for us our home turf was made of bladderack and irish moss <laughs> Yeah, that's really true. And you're absolutely right, getting to know particular areas sort of within that intertidal landscape um, is amazing. And and I always think, uh, partly with my work background, but exploring with, with kids just gives you a fresh and a kind of fun perspective um, on, on that kind of exploration. Yeah, it was lovely seeing it through their eyes, but I really felt for you <laughs> because you were shielding yeah. and you can go out at all and you can get that usual well-being experience that um and the therapy of the rock pools right. and that place that inspires your art so much so each time i went i wanted to kind of bring a little bit of that back for so you um, especially as i just passed your house on my way back from yeah. the shore and... <laughs> yeah those little tubs were like such an exciting gift i was like a child at christmas or you know I was like, oh look what's on the doorstep and yeah it was it was yeah it was just lovely and they were a, a, a connection to the shore as you say that I, I that for that short period of time that i couldn't get to um but also a connection to someone else um, and mm. yeah, so I just could tell finding a, a, the best Christmas present. <laughs> oh, good. I wasn't sure if I was just bringing you lots of extra work, <laughs> especially as I never really gave you any warning. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of the fun. Um, and actually, funnily enough, I, I then worried about the same sort of thing when I was, when we started to, to do look at them a bit more. And I was winging you over messages about, you know, with photographs. And, and I thought, oh, I just got enough with just homeschooling and, you know, working and, and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, it was a great learning process, as we sort of alluded to for both of us. And it was such a creative development sort of session for me. So, yeah, all good. Yeah. <laughs> so, shall we talk about what you did with the seaweeds that I brought to you. Yeah, what well, happened with them from those little tubs. So first, um, as you said, it, the, the weather seemed to just be really good around them. So I was out on our deck working quite a lot and I would just lay, I've got these clear Ferrero Rocher trays. I don't eat all the chocolates. Um, and I lay those out on top of some white uh, boards. Um, and so they're clear. So I could just put the, put the water and the seaweeds in. And to be honest, I just spent quite a bit of time ooing and ahhing over them. Mm -hmm. And I had a little paintbrush that helps to kind of fan out the fronds a little bit so I could see them you know, a bit, a bit more and see the detail. Yeah, so normally we would float them out in a white tray a bit like this, <laughs> wouldn't we? Yeah. And then floating them kind of help to see the detail. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and, and white trays are, are invaluable. But actually, um, the advantage of those transparent trays is that I like to hold them up to the sky. Um, so you're almost looking at them as, as backlit seaweeds. Yeah. And that reminded me a little bit of how we see them in the pools where the light plays with them through the water and things. But it also means that you can get a really good look at their markings and their veins whilst they're still really fresh. And then you could Yeah, photos. took photos with my phone camera. I think just really to capture those first excited moments with them so that I didn't lose those once I kind of got got buried into looking at more of them. 
Yeah, and they were valuable for capturing the colour, weren't they? Because the colour changes really fast once they've come out of water. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it really changes. Um, yeah, so then as well as my phone camera that I was just mostly using for those photographs, I looked at them down a my digital microscope, sort of Wi-Fi microscope, and it's a camera. Um, and I was doing that whilst they were still fresh so that I had photographs at that stage for, to, to have a look at afterwards. Uh, but perhaps we'll do more of that in a, in a minute. <laughs> I think I'd just never previously been able to take or never taken that much uh, time at that stage of it, looking at the seaweeds mm -hmm. and looking, but, you know, really observing. And I think it was the first time it had just taken me deeper than just finding the initial joy of colour and, and, and shape. I got completely drawn in by structure <laughs> and minute detail. And I also began to see some of the commonalities and the, and the differences by taking that time that I could see would aid in their identification of them. Yeah, I mean, I think that strict lockdown time when we were forced to kind of slow down um, and stop doing other things did have its benefits and um, I don't know about you but I needed to slow down a bit in a way <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely yeah I think that's right um yeah and as part of that I you know in my sketchbook I took time to draw many of the seaweeds that you bought me mm. um whilst they were still fresh in those trays um to as you say sort of take time to record their shapes and their sort of standout characteristics um, but also following that, to my surprise, I, I, I wanted to paint. Um, and so I painted that, uh, what I was seeing in those trays. Uh, but again, perhaps a little bit more detail on that in, in a bit. The next stage I went into, you know, when you first brought those up to me, was pressing many of the seaweeds. Um, and that wasn't, again, that was something I hadn't really had time to do mm. before. Um, so I pressed many of the specimens from each batch. Um, so that we could preserve them a little bit and so that we could look at them together. I think we were just sort of saying, you know, when, when restrictions are over, we can kind of really take time to look at them all. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering how, you know, is there anything else that you do? How do you like to look at seaweeds? Well, because I say I really like to look at them underwater. Yeah, um, because then you can see all their three-dimensional magnificence and the colours. Um, um, sometimes I just go to the shore and look at them on the shore. Um, but then if something's puzzling me, I might bring a bit back yeah. and have a closer look at it at home um, with my books around me and things. Um, and sometimes under a microscope too. Um, but I didn't have one in the, in the first mm. lockdown. But this process that we went through, yeah. it really helped because it was it was sort of challenging me about why I thought um, something was was a particular um, species, yeah. and and having to sort of um, again slow down and um, at this stage we were writing up species lists, yeah. weren't we? Yeah. Um, it made me have to consider a, a bit more um, why I thought something was right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, sort of based on that, I think now would be a really nice time to share a little film um, that uh, Rich Strazy brilliantly made <laughs> for us, um, capturing the beauty of the seaweeds um, and some insights into the artwork. Um, but also to give you a little bit of the context of the, of the mm -hmm. cove that we're talking about and the cove that we love so much.
back to what we were talking about just before that, you, well, I think we both sort of mentioned microscopes uh, before that film and certainly yeah. using the, the digital kind of Wi-Fi microscope camera that I was using at home um, to look really closely at, at the seaweeds brought up from the coat was fundamental to how this project kind of developed creatively for me, as well as to improving the ID skills. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with the microscope, you can see such different patterns in seaweeds yeah. at the different scales. And you yeah. can see those, um, those uh, microscopic structures, the cellular level, um, and it's fascinating and you can really get into that world. Um, and for sometimes for scientific identification, you're going to need a microscope um, to really be sure of, of the species. Some species can look very similar to one another. Okay. So you might have to look at the arrangement of cells. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just an aside really, but I quite like the word play when we're talking about microscopes. So we use a microscope to look at macroalgae, um, which is what seaweed is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just my kind of uh, love of words, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> What stage did you use your microscope to look at macroalgae? So yeah, I was too excited not to look down the scope. So sort of whilst the seaweeds were still fresh, really, whilst I had them in the tray, um, and this revealed a, a wonderful and intricate world. I always kind of think it's a little bit like um, Alice in Wonderland. It's the same when I look down microscopes at, at sort of phytoplankton and things. It just feels like you're tumbling into this whole other other world by looking yeah. down this this the tube. <laughs> Um, so it revealed uh, lots to me. Um, so I used it while they were sort of wet and, and, and fresh. I did also, though, uh, once I got a kind of um, pressed specimen collection mm -hmm. from those species that we were looking at, um, I used the microscope again at that stage. And um, I found that was amazing. That revealed stunning and, and kind of much clearer um, images and the detail was, was coming through much, much clearer. And I think that's a different type of scope I was using, not, not being in a lab and not being able to put things on gel on the sides and, and things like that, and not having the light coming up from underneath. Yeah, but, um, but yeah. It, it was useful. Those um, photos you took through your small microscope um, did help us with the identification process. <laughs> they definitely they? did, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think, um, you know, what I love about this project is that it evolved between us um, from that first rock pool. Like you say, we weren't necessarily expecting it. Um, and uh, all these things that we've just been talking about uh, with the microscopes and the, what we were creating, what I was creating and the identifying um, came about as a result of circumstance, responding to circumstances, i.e. lockdown. And never more so than the, the sort of bit I called identifying together apart, which sounds <laughs> slightly dramatic. <laughs> yeah, but of course, we were doing all of our identifying um, of these specimens that I brought back to you by WhatsApp yeah. um, and email. <laughs> and then because we were having to observe the COVID guidance, and even though we live less than 100 metres apart <laughs> across this um, scrubland, um, I actually didn't see you for months. No. <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. We tried to compile a species list for each tub pretty much, didn't we? Um, and for me, this is one of the joys of collaborating with you over this, although like you say, we didn't necessarily see it as a collaboration at the time. We were just doing sort of what, what came naturally. But um, this species list is automatically what you, you know, suggested. And that's where, you know, your scientific background and your understanding of the recording community um, was exciting for me um, and was new for me a little bit um, because it just brought an extra dimension so you know previously perhaps I was I was focusing on the joy that I found in the aesthetic beauty of the seaweed and celebratory response to that um, and kind of wanting to share that with people as a way of engaging other people in in a love for our you know habitats and ecosystems um, and I'd done an ID course before, but it's not the same as one to one. And I think not the same as, as had doing it over a period of time yeah. like we were. So, yeah, I'd message you with my, with <laughs> my first attempts each time at naming what, what I was seeing. Yeah, you did really well. And I was then kind of confirming or suggesting alternatives. And I think it really helped that we both had the same 
ID guide. We had the C yeah. search ID guide series. Um, so we could actually talk about page numbers. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, it can be really hard though, just from photos. So even though I'd collected the seaweed, I would then have to ask you all sorts of questions yeah. to go back and have another look and can you can you count this or can you yeah. check for that? Um, yeah. I sent they went right in front of me um, and, and you had them there on your Ferrero Rocher tray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and all of that was, all of those questions to, to and fro were a really great learning curve for me. Yeah, well, me too. And mostly, yeah, you did that first attempt but then I think one of them um, from one of my dives later, um, when that was allowed, um, <laughs> um, I sent a list with the tub. That's right, you did. And suddenly <laughs> I realised like the advantages of doing that way around. So I could match your, so the names I had in front of me, I could match those to what I was seeing in the in my tubs in front of me, in the, in the trays in front of me. Um, and because I had a name, I could go via the index in the book. Um, and that was really valuable because it would bring me much more specifically to, the, to a page <laughs> um, rather than sort of doing what I had been doing before, which was grappling around a little bit amateurishly <laughs> through so many possible species because there could be 30 pages on flat reds or, or something. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, just having the name was a, was a kind of a, a, a more direct hit <laughs> yeah and that process for me of explaining why I thought it was that yeah um was really yeah a, a challenge and helped confirm where I was happy with identifying or where I needed a bit more practice <laughs> or asking others <laughs> yeah yeah we managed pretty well considering that we were doing this at a distance and not actually looking at the species there and then I only really remember a couple of occasions when we felt it was good to to refer on to somebody else yeah there was um there was one that you asked Maya Plath mm. about and then she referred that one on to Francis Bunker <laughs> um and he came back with two suggestions one was a, a red helminth cycladia cal 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 yeah. yeah and then there was a or even a, a mesoglia which is a brown that had had its pigments bleached. So, I mean, it was a really tricky one because Francis Bunker is the author of that seaweed guide that we were talking about. And even he was finding it hard for a photo. So I think that one needed a microscope. Um, and then there was another one that um, David Fennick, who runs an amazing uh, marine image uh, website, A Photo Marine, um, he had a look at one for us, and that came back as um, Nacaria wiggii, or Nacaria's hairy weed. I love my nice name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I remember you also getting, we had a sort of, well, we had two spirally uh, unknowns, but early on we had one, um, and I think you confirmed it with Paul Brazier from the British Phycological Society, who knew as Dictyopter dichotoma, which we'd just been looking at, but it looking completely different from, yeah. from this curly version that we had. Um, and nicely, that's now forming um, a part of our uh, artwork textile mm -hmm. artwork that I've just been starting this week so <laughs> yeah it all catches up <laughs> um, and it's accepting when you're at the limits of your confident knowledge um, and yeah. being able to refer to others whether yeah. that's peers or whether that's experts at the top of their game um, I think is a really positive way isn't it of, of learning and of sharing understanding about the natural world um, is this really common in the scientific community do you feel yeah it's really important actually we learn about the risks of making an incorrect identification yeah. to species level if it's then going to go on and become a biological record um because it's you need to make sure that the data is high quality yeah. because that can then be used to look at um, trends over time for different species um or as a basis for decisions like yeah. um, which which um areas to protect um so yes it's really normal in the marine um biological community are very good at helping out and there's all sorts of facebook forums and um, where the experts will kind of chip in and confirm your id <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great um so just before we move on from 
from kind of ID taxonomy. I just wanted to ask you a question. So it links. It's all about naming species and, and why we think it's helpful, why, why you think it's helpful. I guess I am with my background in working in creative nature exploration. We were very much about getting the, the kids and families and to, to interact uh, with the nature that was around them um, very much through sensory things and through sort of observing movement and, and colours and all of those kind of things rather than sort of getting, I think we were trying to kind of give them an alternative to getting het up with a scholarly concern for names. Um, but having said that, um, even then I, I was aware, and, and especially as time's gone on, I've become aware that knowing names can be fun and, and playing with the names, particularly with the common names and the why they're why they're given can, can be all sorts of activities. <laughs> but, it, but also I think this, this last year has, has confirmed for me uh, like you say about the, 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 uh, what a tool it is for understanding mm -hmm. um, and for further learning. Have you got anything more to add to, to that? <laughs> yeah, I think um, as scientists, we do place a, a huge amount of importance of on the names of species and yeah, they can be quite hard to learn, particularly if they're based on Latin or Greek, but um, they're the internationally accepted names yes. so they're really vital to our understanding of each species so um often th th they tell you a bit about the species um just thinking about some examples of that you've got um something like pelvicia canaliculata it's got channels um and then there's the olva lactuca sea yeah. lettuce so it's like a lettuce yeah. um and then another a red seaweed, Delisaria sanguinea. So it's the color of blood. Um, so <clears> those, <throat> those names, are, yeah, can, can help to describe what you're looking at. Um, yeah. And species are named by the person who first publishes their description scientifically. Right. Um, they're not allowed to name them after themselves. <laughs> that's the convention. Um, so they're often named after someone who inspired that person, Great. which I think is nice. Um, and an example of that in the seaweeds is the Griffithsia, the <laughs> red seaweeds, um, which are named after Mrs. Amelia Griffiths of Torquay, <laughs> who collected and described a lot of seaweeds in the Georgian era. Amazing, isn't that? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder whether she was getting her skirts, her crinolines wet in the in the uh, waves. Oh, we were. <laughs> <laughs> but what we're saying, I guess, here is that each species um, identified had its, has its own story to tell, yeah. and that the naming process is is part of that story, isn't it? Um, I remember very clearly um, in response to an image I sent you of a specimen. Um, that I didn't quite recognise, but I was trying to make it similar to other things. <laughs> I thought, no, I need to get this to Angie. Um, and you very um, sort of succinctly replied, <laughs> this is all still via WhatsApp, chunkier than placamium um, and without the combs, that's ferrococcus. And I liked that phrase, I really liked that wording so much. Um, and, the, and the reply that, you know, you winged back straight away and it became a, a painting kind of that day um, with both species in. And I added in, I think, the Terrasiphonia because I was also looking at that. Suddenly when you were saying that, I could kind of see the difference and similarities with, with that image as well that I'd taken under the microscope. Um, and so uh, I'm now working on a textile with, with all three of those in. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that, going on from, from, from that, we were sort of identifying from March through to August, really, weren't we, at the beginning of September. So we had eight different, you know, good solid batches that we, we were looking at. And I think that length of time certainly allowed me to kind of have a greater experience, a greater understanding, appreciation of sea seasonal variations um, in seaweeds. What do you particularly notice or love about seaweeds on different times of the year on the coast? Oh, well, um, I think the um, timing of lockdown was fortuitous for me <laughs> at first of all, because um, they look their best in the early spring. Um, they're all fresh and clean and new growth. Um, and then later in the season, they can they cover more of the shore 
um, they, they're bigger, mm -hmm. um, but they start to get munched by grazers, um, like flat periwinkles and those gorgeous blue rayed limpets that we like to see on the help, <laughs> but they do a lot of damage to the yeah. help. Um, so, and then uh, later again, I, at this time of year, we're starting to get some really big storms. Yeah. I mean, this coast, north coast of Cornwall is so exposed. Mm -hmm. These seaweeds that um, are still there at this yeah. time of year are getting completely fattened. Yeah. So they yeah. start to look quite tatty, even the tough ones. Yes. Um, yeah. And they also get bleached yeah. by the sun, um, yeah. particularly the ones higher up the shore. So they can change colour quite a lot throughout yeah. the year. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, that's uh, it was quite a nice kind of uh, segue into the next bit. But um, those seasonal variations um, have really come to my attention again whilst I've been looking back through our pressings because um, some of those colours are, are retained, not all, but some of those colours, colour variations from the different seasons and certainly the mm. shapes and forms uh, are, are retained in that pressing collection. I suppose recently just the last couple of weeks I've been comparing um, two pressings that I had of Mastercarpa stellata for example um, so the great pit weed and, and one in its lime green colour oh, yeah. um, uh, and looking really fleshy and, and kind of fresh and, and like, like you say um, but and the, and the pits were, were the sort of reproductive bits aren't they and, and they they were kind of really showing in that lovely kind of orangey red kind of definition that they have but then the other uh, piece of that I have is is dark and uh, deep deep red mm. um, and yeah. uh, almost black, almost black and yeah. very spindly um, so yeah those two definitely kind of stood out in my mind um, yeah from yeah. the pressings yeah so pressed seaweeds are still how scientists today um, would store uh, seaweeds and um, yeah, keep them in museums. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and, and, and done so kind of a long, uh, for a long time. I mean, that's historically been yes, a, yes, an art of science, hasn't it? Or a science of art. <laughs> hasn't really changed. And then, um, although new techniques nowadays um, are allowing people to extract DNA from old precursor okay. specimens, um, so that's, that's still preserved in those pressings. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so in that case, uh, is pressing helpful to the recording process that we aim to do? Um, or is photography of fresh specimens preferable, which which might help? You've talked about kind of you know, verifying our, our kind of collection, um, which would help. Yeah. So for that, the pressings are invaluable because they are the actual seaweed um, and they can be um, used to verify records, they can be sent to somebody physically in the post yeah. to check. Yeah. Um, and photos are just rarely good enough to actually pick up the detail that, that you need for tricky species. Yeah. So that I uh, kind of firstly that sums up what beautiful kind of art and science collaboration, not only seaweed observation, but the pressing itself mm. is. Um, and we thought that would be a kind of a nice thing to share sort of live with you now just a, a brief kind of seaweed pressing <laughs> yeah turns out that we were both taught to press seaweeds by the amazing <laughs> professor Juliet Brody of the natural history museum so we need to um, not let her down huh? no <laughs> so we're just going to kind of move behind this table <laughs> and hope that you can see enough Here's the noise of the chairs Again, put your uh, put your Zoom on speaker view if you haven't done so yet. Then you're going to be able to yeah. see more. Okay. So, um, some seaweeds that we brought back from the cove in a tub and a lockdown, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we've got the white tray with some water in it, and um, ideally sea water. Um, Okay, you're going to take a piece of what kind of paper? So, we've got a piece of paper, and we usually just make sure that that's what we always make sure that that's an acid free paper. Um, but it can be, you know, reasonable thickness is good because um, it just has a bit more weight to it then. Um, but it's worth just experimenting with different papers. 
and I usually kind of wet the paper first. I don't know whether you like to do that, Angie. I was what do you want? Say, to... I would um, first of all, for um, recording ah, yeah. purposes, I would write <laughs> in pencil on the paper um, my name and the date and or the date of the collection of the seaweed um, and also the species or as close as I can get to an identification of the species. So in this case, it's Dulce palmaria palmata. And the location where it was collected. Stravonance, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm writing those in pencil at the bottom. And then we'll pop them. If we pop that in the water, in the tray of water, so it's worth having a sort of enough depth. Okay. Oh, there's a stalk jellyfish. Oh, that's sad. Okay. Then you would put your put your seaweed in, in the water, and this is where the art comes into it. So you can take <laughs> as long as you like to spread that seaweed out and make it look beautiful on the paper. But also, um, but also you want to spread it out so that you can see the ID features. Um, so you don't want too many bits overlapping, especially because that will make it take longer to dry out. It can be where sometimes it's worth just taking a little pair of scissors and cutting some bits, aren't there, so you get more of it yeah. clearly. And, um, and again, paintbrush is quite handy <laughs> for kind of splaying it out a little bit more so you get to see the bits that you want to see. Especially with the fine. With yeah, the when you ones. get the really feathery ones. Yeah. Do you want to take that? Oh, that's okay. fine. Um, and what you want to have, yeah, what you want to have to hand is, um, I mean, it's a bit like flower pressing when, when, you, when you're a kid. Uh, or, and you're wanting to have something that'll absorb some of the water off that. So if we hold it up, you can kind of see the rough <laughs> idea. <laughs> That's on the paper. Yeah, so it's on, on the paper. And we're just going to use, I've got some, some brown paper underneath. You can have newspaper and um, mm -hmm. cardboard. And um, I've got Joe cloths here just to kind of pop, pop over the seaweed. Um, but we were saying that actually a lot of people choose to use nappy liners um, to go over the top because they yeah, absorb without sticking to the seaweed. So we might pop one or two on top of there. And then really it's a layering, layering up process, up. isn't it? Yeah. So you can you might have four or five samples from that section, and you might want to put some newspaper in between each one. Um, and then do the layering again. And I tend to collect these kind of inners from, <laughs> from cardboard boxes or from kind of deliveries and find that they're quite a useful way of having a file. So hopefully that gives you. A rough idea. So you're just sort of folding those with the layers up inside. And then a heavy weight. Say about that. And then we go and get one of the really heavy books. <laughs> and because they're wet, obviously, especially if you're doing quite a few, um, you need to change the papers quite frequently, otherwise they rot. So for the first 24 hours, you need to change them two or three times. And then after that, you've probably changed them about once a day and you keep on going until they're dry, which can take, it might take a week, but it's normally just a few days. Yeah. Depending on yeah. how many you've got and how thick they are. So <laughs> seaweeds are a lot thicker than others. There are lots of other YouTube uh, guides, I think, out there to have if you want to have a look a bit more closely. I think the only other thing on pressing it, it, that comes to mind for me is that it's it's a good chance to, to say about picking seaweeds kind of sustainably so if you are wanting you know it's it's become quite a popular thing uh it seems around the world now and it's nice to think that we can kind of collect what's already on the strand line as much as possible and what's floating uh rather than taking a lot of specimens of whole fasts <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's really satisfying <laughs> and very easy. So you should give it a go. And you can end up with, with so this is an example 
to show you that one of one of the ones that we pressed last year. So they can be very beautiful work of art in their own right, as well as scientific records. Spin up a bit. Okay, so now we're back. We're going to talk about what your creative response was to the seaweed exploration that we did. Yeah, well, I'll try and keep this quite brief because hopefully in a minute you can kind of see some of it. Um, interestingly, working from home um, under lockdown necessitated a simpler creative process, really. Um, but to my surprise, this didn't impede my creativity. I, it triggered a, a rather excitable explosion of paintings initially. <laughs> and looking down the scope, as we've said, kind of influenced me hugely, you know, awestruck gazing at those complexities that you can see within such tiny fragments of album treasure, you know, two centimetres across. Um, but rather than wishing to recreate and render um, what I was seeing at, at size, uh, perhaps in the tradition of botanical drawing or, or scientific illustration, I immediately wanted to kind of just go big and, and work on big pieces of paper and, um, and play with the scale. So I think I wanted to sort of express the sheer um, delight at exploring these, <laughs> these species down the microscope and, and, and to visually shout about their kind of incredible forms and patterns. Oh, cool. And did the process of us identifying and sourcing and all of that, did that influence yeah work. very definitely yes yeah, so i think looking more rigorously gave rise to a um, bit more accurate understanding of the species than i previously kind of mastered or gone into um, but somehow at the same time this sort of scientifically realistic detail invited um kind of creative licensing and and shifted almost a lot of what i was doing into kind of a more abstract uh, sort of process um, so I think this is again you know science and art kind of crossing over at the very yeah. heart of this creative journey and have they stayed as painting well if, if you can see clearly <laughs> enough through here a lot of the paintings are still on the easels of my studio um, and they will be available as standalone pieces when I uh, when we're all kind of reopen and, um, a bit more um, back to normal next year um, so that's been that's been lovely rarely have the painting of my paintings been you know, final incarnation. But of course, <laughs> they are fundamentally part of the process working towards these kind of um, uh, textile artworks. Yeah, so how did you go about um, capturing the amazing array of colours in these seaweeds with your textile? Um, yeah, so many different techniques, which is the way I like to work anyway. Yeah. So I dye a lot of fabrics um, so that their colours can best reflect the seaweeds to the best of my abilities. But I also create a lot of the actual backgrounds, so I'm creating the materials themselves um, through embroidery, through stitch, um, and through handmade felts that I do here on this table that we've just been using. Um, and I know that layering up those many different processes can allow those colours to, to really kind of sing out. Um, and in a kind of reproduction of what we're seeing on the shore, really, when we look at the seaweeds, the way I work with the materials, with the fabrics, can um, either be like pigment. We're either looking at the pigments um, and colours or, we're, or by layering up the different fabrics, we're actually recreating some of that iridescence that we see as the light plays in the water on the, on the conjures Christmas or, or other species, yeah. Okay, we've put together a little um, short studio slideshow, <laughs> give you the chance to slow down and enjoy this visual process unfolding, Jo working her magic. <laughs> Just gone species by species here on the shore. Yeah, particularly focused, I guess, on some of the ones that we, we loved on the shore but have found their way into the textiles. Some of my unexpected paintings. <laughs> The iridescent one. It's a little purple. Talking about mm -hmm. earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. with the bright green. 
and that's yeah i put the ones in circles that are looking down the microscope and actually that's got little seranium bits of curing on it as well doesn't it yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> much finer species. Yeah, the other ones. Yeah. The little hearts you pointed out at the end. <laughs> yes. Sweet. They are sweet. And they often grow on other, other species, don't they? Yeah. And then this is the one that we were referring to earlier when I was saying about the Procamium and the Sphericoccus and this is the combs that you were showing me. The microscope. Again, it's sort of when you get to the painting and the, and the textiles, it's, it is very much allowing for the artistic license <laughs> as well as the uh, scientific knowledge. And quite often, that is a much longer, redder, deeper That's species, isn't it? The dull. Yeah. yeah. Crazy species. <laughs> uh, specimen, I mean. This is from a dive, wasn't it? Yeah, that one was from a dive. Yeah, yeah and that's two of the, the sort of big A2 type pieces that are coming out of it. I'm just going to share with you. Gorgeous. It's amazing what you do with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, to just to sort of round off, I guess, really, um, this artwork that you've just, just seen um, is perhaps the current culmination of our seaweed journey, our seaweed story of the last year. It sort of feels like it's come a full circle, kind of looking back at what we were seeing and then looking at the artwork. But it also is only a beginning, I think. <laughs> um, it sort of unfolded organically, as we said, when we were rock pooling, we didn't expect to spend the year looking at it in, like, in this way. And it tells very much of not only an art and science collaboration, but of forging friendships through a love of local ecosystems and the will to try and um, engage other people in, in sharing those ecosystems and protecting those ecosystems. Yes, especially now we've also worked with Rich to bring the film footage to you. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And it's no doubt the beginning of much more kind of shared community seaweed exploring and understanding of perhaps with our seaweed sisters, some of who are out there across the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very um, insightful and inspiring. Um, really, thank you. And a wonderful example of how uh, art and science work together and how the, the thinking of the artist coming together with the thinking of the scientist creates something new for both of them so that we, we can, it can just help us to think out of the box and ex this explore new ways of knowing i think in arts and in science so really wonderful thank you so much <laughs>